Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 12 of I2DL. Let's start with the lecture 11 recap. In lecture 11, we started discussing transfer learning. Imagine you have a very large data set with annotations where you can train your neural network on, for example, ImageNet. You're actually interested in another task for which you have a small data set, small um, number of annotations. And the question is, can you actually leverage the information learned from task one, from the large data set, and use it somehow for task two, for which you have only the small data set? This is what transfer learning is. Use what you can learn from the large data set and transfer it into another setting for which you have only a small data set. For this, we saw several ways of performing transfer learning, especially in the context of image analysis, of image classification, for which you can train your convolutional neural network on the large scale ImageNet data set. And then take a new data set for which you have, for example, a different number of classes, C classes, take the last fully connected layer that was trained for ImageNet and that is no longer usable for this new data set and replace it with a new fully connected layer that will output C classes. Now what you can do is you can freeze all the layers at, except this last fully connected layer and therefore train only that layer with a new data set. The more data points you have, the more annotations you have for the second task, the more layers you can train of your convolutional neural network. Now we usually do take advantage of transfer learning in computer vision, especially of the early features that are extracted and learned from ImageNet. These are features that are incredibly transferable from one task to the other, from image classification to image segmentation, for example. We then moved into recurrent neural networks, networks that can process sequences, uh, that can process these, these data points that come one after the other. And so RNNs capture the notion of time, the notion of sequence, of having an order of elements that comes one after the other. And we saw the basic structure of an RNN, how we have a set of weights, theta C, that process the previous hidden state, and we have a set of weights, theta X, that process the input. And then the creation of the hidden state at the current time step comes from the combination between the previous hidden state and the input. We then also discuss about long-term dependencies. For example, you have um, the task of filling in the gaps in a sentence. And you have the start of the sentence that says, I moved to Germany. And the end of the sentence that says, so I speak blank fluently. And now you have to fill in this blank. You have to fill it with the most probable word. Now for this, imagine that this sentence is really long. And in between these two sub-sentences, you have really a lot of sentences in the middle explaining how this person moved to Germany and what happened when this person moved to Germany. And so if you want to predict this work at t plus 1 here, you would have to go all the way back to t0 and t equal 1 to actually establish this link between the action of moving to Germany and the fact that this person speaks now German fluently. Now, of course, if these two time steps, 1 and t plus 1, are very, very far apart, it's going to be really hard for the recurrent neural network to keep this information always in the hidden state A. For this, we saw LSTM Unix long-term, long short-term memory units. They're designed specifically to tackle this issue of long-term memory. And we discussed the elements of the LSTM unit. Now, the most important one is the cell, 
The cell is this highway here that we have depicted at the top of the LSTM unit that transports the information throughout the unit. And it transports it from time step t minus 1 to time step t. And then we have all of these elements here at the bottom that interact with the cell state and change it according to the current information, the current input that comes from xt. And the fact that we have this cell state means that for back propagation, we also have this highway for the gradient to flow. And this is similar to the concept of ResNets that also had these skip connections that always allow the gradient to flow from one point to the other. So it doesn't matter what are the operations that happen here, it doesn't matter if we have vanishing gradients here, the gradients are always going to have this highway to flow and therefore it is much harder to have vanishing gradients with LSTM than with vanilla recurrent neural networks. And this means that now we do have more capacity to learn these long-term dependencies. So we start now with lecture 12. In this lecture, we want to discuss few advanced deep learning topics. We will not go into detail into all of these topics because, of course, we do not have physical time to cover all the topics in detail, but we want to give you an idea, a kind of the intuition behind all of these advanced DL techniques so that you can then choose to go deeper into the techniques that you're most interested in. So since we covered recurrent neural networks in the last lecture, we will start with a technique called attention, a technique that is gaining more and more popularity in recent, uh, in the, in the recent days uh, in the research community. So attention wants to tackle the same problem of long-term dependencies. So for very, very long-term dependencies, LSTMs are still not enough. And hence, we um, leverage a concept that is called attention. And the intuition behind attention is to add between the hidden state that processes the input and the previous hidden state and the output, we want to add in between uh, these two processing units something that is called a context. And what this context does is it captures the relationship between the current time step and all the other time steps. So in this case, this concept, this context starts by having um, these variables, which we will call alpha, which are the attention variables, which are the weights that represent how important time step t plus 1 is in order to predict the output at t plus 1. So obviously, this is going to be rather important. Now, the interesting thing in, is when we start computing the alpha values, the attention values, at further and further um, time steps. For example, what is the relationship between time step t, right, the hidden state at time step t, and the output at time step t plus 1? And we can create all of these variables for all of the time steps going all the way back to t equal to 0 if we want. And now we gather all of these variables and we process them together into what is called a context. And so now the architecture for uh, the recurrent neural network that has attention will have some other elements. It will have a separation between what is called the encoder, which is now, which is our old hidden state A, and the decoder. And in between these two um, layers, we will include the context information. Now, the decoders act the same way as the previous hidden state A. Therefore, they take also the previous decoder hidden state. So this is still this, this recurrent architecture, but now we have decided that we first 
process the input with the encoder A and we will have a similar um, architecture for the decoder that is going to process the output. And of course, the decoder is also going to take the previous output in order to have more information on how to decode this sequence. So with attention, we have also a richer way to decode information, typically. And now the key element here is the context. This context that gathers the information from different time steps. So that actually takes in the relationship of the different time steps with respect to the current output at t plus 1. And you can imagine that, for example, let's, let's go back to this, um, this other depiction where it might be more clear. So let's imagine that um, this is a very long sequence. And here there have been um, some, for example, vanishing gradients. And it is really, really hard to keep the information of time t equals 0 in this hidden state at t plus 1. Nonetheless, the context is telling me that there is a very high alpha, right? So the attention value is going to be very, very large between time step 0 and time step t plus 1. So if this value is really large, it's telling me to pay more attention to this particular hidden state at t0 or at t1. Right? This is the strength of attention. doesn't matter what happened down here. We're going to have a really large attention that creates a direct connection between time step t plus 1 and time step 1. And so the, this is the, um, the initial um, intuition, the initial um, spark of the transformer architecture. So the transformer architecture goes one step further and says, well, what if we actually get rid of the recurrent architecture? So we don't want to process the information sequentially, but we just want to have these connections here that allow us to look at different time steps as we need. Now, if to decode the word at t plus 1, it is very, very important to look at time step 1, then I'm going to have my attention variable alpha 1 comma t plus 1 that is going to be very large and is going to force me to pay attention to the hidden state at time t. So, with this, if we could actually create an architecture that is not recurrent but just uses attention, then all of the memory problems of recurrent neural networks would disappear because I would have direct connections between time step 0 and time step t plus 1. And this was the idea behind this paper, Attention is All You Need, in which they propose an architecture entirely based on attention. And so the idea is that we don't use RNNs, we don't use CNNs, we just use attention. We just use these connections, direct connections between how we process one variable and how we process a variable that is t time steps away. And currently transformers are the current state of the art in natural language processing. For example, in machine translation, we use transformers and not recurrent architectures anymore. So transformers have really replaced completely recurrent neural networks for natural language processing. And so the difference between an RNN and transformer can be seen in this graph here. So in RNN, what we do is we process these um, the, the words in a sentence in a sequential way, right? So I analyze this word, then I analyze this word, then I analyze this word, and there are no connections between the first word and the fourth word. And with only these connections, these sequential connections, I have to perform translation, sentiment analysis, next word prediction, any task in natural language processing. Transformers, on the other hand, are based on tension. And therefore, they have connections all over the place. 
All the words are connected with all the words and we're going to have these alpha values that are going to tell us how these two words are related to each other. Right? Are, are they very strongly connected or are they independent? You know, I could have any word here in the fourth place if I have this word here in the first place. But the cool thing is that you have all of these connections that allow you to have a more broader view of the relationship of words compared to these only sequential connections. Now, transformers have um, a lot of other ingredients. They have several normalization layers and other ingredients to actually make them work. So this is by far um, not, uh, um, let's say, a deep view of transformers, right? This, this is just the intuition behind transformers. And also intuitively, this idea of having connections from all elements to all elements is very, very related to another important neural network architecture. And these are graph neural networks. So we can see graph neural networks as a clear equivalent to attention in which we have this structure, this graph structure, which would be one node for each word, and then connections between all the words or between all the nodes. So attention and graph neural networks are inherently related. So let's have a brief look at what graph neural networks are. These networks are becoming increasingly popular because they are more flexible than, for example, CNN. And therefore, we can process information that is not as fixed, that doesn't have this structure that, for example, the image has. So let me tell you why this is. So in graph neural networks, we first have to define the concept of a graph. And a graph consists of several nodes that we have depicted here and several connections between nodes. Now, nodes represent, for example, a concept, could be a word, could be an image, and an edge represents a connection between these concepts, just like we had for attention before, where we have connection between words. And now the idea is that we want to perform deep learning on graphs, on these structures that are very, very special and are much less um, constrained, much less fixed than images. So we have to find generalization of neural networks that can operate on these graph structure domains. And so here you have um, some papers that you can read if you want to get uh, to delve deeper into graph neural networks, into neural message passing networks or graph convolutional networks. But in general, when working on graphs, when doing um, deep learning on graphs, we have a set of key challenges. First of all, we have variable sized inputs. So the number of nodes and the number of edges can change. And this is why I say that um, these graph structures are much more flexible than the image structure. So a CNN always works in a domain that has a fixed size and a fixed structure, and that is an image, right? You have one pixel after the other, you can apply your convolutional kernels, you know how to apply them. The domain is very, very well established. While here, the number of nodes and the number of edges changes as we go from one graph to the other. And of course, we cannot be constrained on doing deep learning on a fixed set of nodes and edges. This would be incredibly constraining. Therefore, we need to find operations that generalize to the number of nodes and the number of edges. And we also need invariance to node permutations. So if we have a graph that represents, for example, um, sets of images, and I want to find relationship between images. I don't care if image one is related, is, is represented by node one, and image two is represented by node two. They will always have the same relationship. And this means that I need some sort of invariance on node permutations. 
If image one is related to node five, node three, node four, I don't care, right? Node permutations should not change my result. So I need operations that are invariant to node permutations. And so this is the general idea of a message passing network or graph neural networks. First of all, we need to create our input. We need to create the graph which will have optional node and edge feature vectors. That is that each node is going to be represented by a feature vector. For example, if each node represents an image, I could use a CNN to extract some features from that image. And with uh, my bottleneck representation of my CNN, let's say 128 vector, I could use this as a node feature vector to express what is the content of, not, of that node. What is that node representing? And I can also have edge feature vectors, right? Vectors that represent the relationship between the two nodes. For example, the relationship between the two images. Now, this is the input construction, the graph construction. And now I'm going to go through a series of hidden layers. But these are not hidden layers as we had for convolutional neural networks, but are layers in which an information propagation takes place. So one step of information propagation creates what is called a hidden layer. So what we're going to do is we're going to propagate information across the graphs for several iterations. If I have 12 iterations, then I have 12 hidden layers. Just so we have a mapping between the vocabulary between uh, convolutional neural networks and graph neural networks. Now, the operation that happens inside the layer is not a convolution, but it's rather an information propagation step. Now, once all this information has been propagated, we have an output, a graph, with updated what we call context-aware nodes and possibly edge feature vectors. So the thing that has changed are these feature vectors. Right? So imagine that I'm a node and I have my feature vector. Now I start talking to my neighboring nodes, to my neighboring edges, and I start passing information about these feature vectors. So I'm seeing the feature vectors of my neighbors and I'm getting an idea you know, am I similar to my neighbors or not, for example. And so as an output now, my feature vector not only represents myself, the, the node, but represents also my neighbors, right? I have updated my feature vector with all these information propagation steps. So of course, the interesting part is this information propagation, right? How does this happen? Well, in what we call message passing networks, we have two types of propagation. One propagation that goes from nodes to edges and one propagation that goes from edges to nodes. So we have this initial graph and here what I'm going to depict in yellow are the node embeddings, these feature vectors that represent the nodes. And in green, I'm going to have the edge embeddings, the feature vectors that represent the edges. So in the first step, we want to update the edge embeddings. And we do this with the propagation of information from nodes to edges. That is, each node communicates with the corresponding edges that connect to that node and sends some information. And so every edge embedding, every green embedding, is going to receive information from the yellow embeddings, is going to process it with a small neural network, and it's going to create a new edge embedding. It's going to update its embeddings. This is the first step. In a second step, the opposite happens. The edges communicate with the nodes. That is, for example, for this node here, receives all of the information from connecting edges, processes it, and updates its own node embedding. So these steps happen um, alternatively. So we have node to edge, edge to node, node to edge, edge to node. Information is being passed. 
And so every time that I perform one of these node to it and edge to node updates, I get information from nodes that are two steps away, right? So every one of these message passing steps means that I get information from further and further away nodes. So I'm getting more the context of the network with these message passing steps. So what does a node to edge update look like? Well, after every message passing step, what we do is we get um, the embedding of node I, right? So this is the embedding that node I had for message passing step L minus one. So until that point, node I had this embedding. And the same for the embedding of, of node J. So these are the two nodes that are connecting to the edge IJ. So there's an edge IJ that connects node I with node J. So the first thing that you do is you get the embedding of node I and node J. The current embedding of the edge, which is edge IJ, right? This is the edge embedding, this is a node embedding, and this is another node embedding. You take all of these embeddings and you pass them through an edge updating tiny neural network. Right? This is a small neural network that's going to gather all of this information, it's going to process it, and it's going to create a new edge embedding. And of course, the learning part happens with this function inside this function here. This is a learnable function. For example, a multi-layer perceptron. And the weights of this learnable function are shared across the entire graph. So all of the edges are going to be updated in the exact same way. And this is really cool, right? Because you're treating all of the edges the same way, right? This is the real power behind neural networks, uh, graph neural networks, that you can learn from all the edges and all the connections in order to create the best function to share information between nodes and edges. So this is the easy update. The edge to node update is more interesting because now the edge embeddings, right? We have performed one node to edge updates and the edge embedding contains information about the pair of incident nodes. And now what the edge embedding does is it sends information out to the nodes. But this is the critical thing, right? That we know that two nodes are connected to an edge, because that's the definition of an edge, but we don't know how many edges are connected to a node. And this is where we need what is called an order invariant operation. So we need to have an operation that, first of all, is invariant to the order of the edges and is invariant to the number of edges. So we need to gather all of the hidden states here, all the feature vectors of the connecting edges, uh, edges, right? So all the neighbors of node i. Here we're trying to update the feature vector of node i. We gather all the neighboring edges, all the edges that connect to node i, could be, you know, many. We gather all of them here. And now we need to have an operation here that can deal with as many edges and that is um, order invariant, right? I don't care if I take the first edge first, the second edge first, there is no order really in the edges. And so these operations can be, for example, a summation, a min, a maximum, one of these order invariant operations. And so what we do is we gather all of this information and we create a message, right? This is the message for node i. And now we do the update part, right? This um, learnable function, which is different from the edge learnable function, this is just a node specific learnable function that takes the message, this collection of information, right? This aggregation um, that collects information about neighbors. Uh, concatenates it with the current feature embedding for node i, and then passes it through this learnable function, this, for example, MLP, which has these shared weights across the entire graph again, and creates the embedding for node i. 
right? So this is what we're going to use um, to update all the nodes in the graph with this contextual information about the neighbors. And now we can do really cool things by working on this new domain, on the graph domain. For example, we can tackle the task of multi-object tracking with graph neural networks. So in multiple object tracking, we usually divide the tracking step into two parts. First of all, detecting the objects of interest. For example, in this case, we want to track these pedestrians over the different video frames. And of course, detection is not perfect, so we might have some false positives like we have here depicted in yellow. And so what we can do is we can put a graph on top of this representation where each node represents a detection. And now the edges will represent trajectories. That is, if we are connecting two nodes or three nodes in three frames, that is, if we have this edge active, it means that these two nodes, these two detections, belong to the same person. This is a classic view of multiple object tracking with graphs, no neural networks yet. And so solving the graph, solving all the possible connections, means finding all the pedestrians in the scene. So now we want to use this model, this view of multiple object tracking with graphs, and tackle the problem with graph neural networks. That is, we're going to do exactly the same. We're going to do object detection. And then we're going to build a graph. But instead of directly solving this graph with any classic techniques for data association that you might know, like, for example, the Hungarian algorithm, we're going to use this graph to perform learning with graph neural networks. Now, this is the rough pipeline that we have for how to use message passing networks or graph neural networks to solve the multiple object tracking problem. Now, first, we need our input, right? We need to create our graph. And our graph consists of detections. Each node represents a detection. And each embedding for the node is going to be given by this CNN here which extracts visual features from each detection, right? So this is how we're going to construct our graph with the node features. We're going to have also edge features, but we're not going to go into detail here. Now, the interesting part is that we're not solving the problem directly, right? One could apply any solver, like the Hungarian matching algorithm, and solve the graph problem. But here we're interested in, once we have this graph constructed with the features, we're interested in performing neural message passing steps, right? The sharing of information between node and edges. And you can imagine what the sharing of information does. It looks at one node at time step one, for example, and another node at time step two. They share some information and they see that their visual features are very similar. Therefore, the network realizes that maybe these two boxes represent the same person, and therefore they should have an active edge in between, right? They should be connected. On the other hand, this detection, this node, is also connected to this pedestrian here. They share features and they see, no, we are not representing the same person. The visual features are too different. Therefore, we're not going to have a connection. So with this sharing of information, it becomes much easier to then have a second step in which we classify the edges, right? This edge classification chooses which edges to activate. Therefore, we're going to have a connection between two nodes and which edges not to activate. And this edge classification comes with yet another neural network, another, for example, MLP, that takes in the feature vector of the edge and classifies it into active or not active. So aside from the sharing of information, you also have the task that you want to solve. And if this task would be, for example, edge classification, like is this case, 
Then you would have this neural network that acts on top of the feature vector of the edge and classifies it into whatever categories you need. And from these, from these connections, you can then extract trajectories like we have here, the red, the yellow, blue and green trajectories. The second part of this lecture is going to focus on generative models. So you have probably seen even on the news all of these networks that are able to generate fake images. So in order to have images being generated, we need to have outputs for the neural networks that actually have the same width and height as the input, for example. And we saw how to do this with fully convolutional networks. So recall the lecture in which we briefly discussed how fully convolutional networks were able to encode all the information of the image with a normal CNN and then decode it, upscale it, in order to perform, um, in order to have as output the same input size, so a full resolution input size. Now, this particular paper does it uh, in a rather brute force fashion, so it goes from the low level representation and just upsamples it. But there are better ways to do this. And we saw the encoder decoder unit architecture that was, for example, used here in SegNet in order to go from RGB image to segmentation, semantic segmentation output. So in this case, for each pixel of the input image, we have a semantic class assigned in the output image. And how you do this is by having this um, more soft um, decrease in spatial size in the encoder, which we know how to do with convolution and pooling layers. And then we have the decoder, which also has a soft, but this time increase of the spatial size. So it goes from the bottleneck representation, which can be found here in the middle, all the way to the image with upsampling and convolution operations. And so we're going to work with this architecture, which can be used for um, semantic segmentation or for any other task. But if we want to use it for image generation, having an autoencoder type of architecture and having, for example, an L2 loss here might not be the best idea. Why is that? Well, because um, generative models, um, they need to work with a given training data, for example, these, um, these real images here. And they need to be able to generate new samples from the same distribution, right? I'm not interested in reconstructing exactly these letters, but in learning in general what a lattice is and being able to generate different types of lattices. So, of course, if we use just this autoencoder type of architecture, we don't get really nice um, generated images. The generated images don't really make sense. And this is, um, this is why um, several types of generative models were uh, presented. So there's um, generative models that explicitly model the density, right? This, um, this landscape of images that we actually want to, want to capture and want to sample from and generate a new image from. There are other generative models like GAN that have an implicit density. So we're going to briefly discuss two types of generative models, the variational autoencoder and uh, the generative adversarial networks. Now in the variational autoencoder, the idea is very simple. The idea is that we're still going to use autoencoders, which, have, which, which can be used for, for generative purposes, but we want to improve what happens in this representation, right? We want to improve the bottleneck representation. And this is because all of the information for the generative process is contained in this bottleneck representation, right? From this bottleneck, we have the decoder that then generates the image. So the question is, if I give more structure to this bottleneck representation, can I generate better images? 
And so we can see how, um, what is, for example, the, the, this ladle in space, this uh, bottleneck uh, representation, when we train an autoencoder on the MNIST data set, right? We can see all of this, um, for example, the distance between the ones and the sevens and all of the other numbers um, displayed here. So now the question is, can I give a little bit more structure to this representation so that I can, for example, sample from this representation and obtain a number that is meaningful in the case of MNIST. And so what a variational encoder does is it still uses this idea of encoder and decoder. But now we say for the generative process, we need some very important thing, which is that we need to be able to sample from this bottleneck, from this uh, latent distribution, right? For, for uh, reconstruction purposes that, uh, where we might use, for example, an autoencoder, we don't need to sample anything, right? We're not interested in generating new images. But in the case of um, generation, image generation, we want to be able to sample from this latent distribution so that each sample brings us a new output. And of course, these samples need to make sense, right? Otherwise, we just sample random numbers and then we get garbage as output. So here what we want is we want to be able to sample from this latent distribution. And so for this, I'm going to constrain this latent distribution to be a Gaussian distribution, right? Instead of saying I have just uh, Z here in the middle of the bottleneck and the encoder creates fully Z, the encoder is responsible for outputting these two values which represent a Gaussian distribution. And from this distribution that I am creating here, I am performing the sampling, this sampling that is going to then generate a new image. So this is essentially how I can generate new images from the distributions, the Gaussian distributions that are learned from the training data with my encoder. And so the encoder is going to learn the mean and diagonal covariance for my Gaussian distribution. And so at training time now, I need to make sure that two things happen. First of all, I need to make sure that the reconstructed output is close to the input, right? I can train all of this architecture by saying, I have my input image, my lattice image. I encode it into this mean and covariance, into this distribution. Then I sample from that, and I want to have an output that is very, very similar to my input, for example. So I want to be able to reconstruct lattices properly. And at the same time, I want to make sure that this latent space has the structure that I want it to have, which in this case is a unit Gaussian, right? So I have these two losses battling for having a good reconstruction and at the same time having a latent space that is close to a unit Gaussian. Now at test time, I can forget about the encoder. I can just sample from my latent space and generate a new image of a new lattice, for example. So now the advantage of using a pure autoencoder with this uh, free bottleneck and using a variational autoencoder with this unit Gaussian bottleneck is that I get much sharper images. So you can see how the classic autoencoder trained for reconstruction gives sort of blurry images. So all the images are kind of the same, while the variational autoencoder gives really nice sharp images because this sampling um, step has been modeled into the training. We have seen this sampling step and now we're able to generate fives and sixes and fours and not this, this mix uh, of numbers as it happens for the autoencoder. And the other cool thing is that uh, we can interpret the, um, the different uh, channels, right? The different dimensions of our feature vector, of our bottleneck, now have an interpretation. So for example, for, for this um, head pose generation, 
we can interpret that one of the dimensions is responsible for the degree of smile. So if I sample along that dimension, then I get faces that go from smiling all the way to kind of angry face. If I take another dimension, I see that it's responsible for changing the head pose. So if I sample along that dimension, I see that the head pose changes from left to right. So now, essentially, the bottleneck has an interpretation. We have given an interpretation to the bottleneck and therefore also to the sampling procedure. So autoencoders are good for reconstructing output, good for unsupervised learning. They can map images to semantic segmentation maps, for example. But uh, variational autoencoders have a much more powerful um, generative um, characteristics. So they have this, um, this way of fitting uh, the latent space or modeling the latent space as an explicit probability distribution. So we can have an interpretable latent space, like, like we had for the head pose, for the degree of smile. And we can also sample from this model. So we can generate new images every time. We move on now to the nowadays king of the generative models, generative adversarial network or GANs. So these have seen a huge increase in, in the usage of GANs, uh, for example, for uh, in papers, in research papers. You can see the increase from 2015 to 2019, like really, really high increase going all the way to 500 papers that um, have some sort of GAN name in their title. So really a boost of, of usage of this technique. And in order to motivate GANs and the formulation of GANs, we go back to the autoencoder, right? We had our encoder that encodes an image into a bottleneck layer and a decoder that tries to reconstruct it. Now, usually this is trained with a reconstruction loss, an L2 loss, which can give blurry results as we can see here in the output image. Now test time, as we remember, we can sample from the bottleneck layer in order to obtain a new image, better with a variational autoencoder than with an autoencoder. But we're not talking about the bottleneck layer now, we're talking about the loss in which we train this reconstruction process, which is often the L2 loss. Now, the thing is that this L2 loss, which is a sum of squares distances, distributes the error equally, right? So the mean is the optimum. So typically what this delivers are blurry results. Now, for a generative model, this is not optimal, right? We want crisp results, and you have seen a lot of GAN outputs which look very crisp. So for sure, they were not generated with an L2 reconstruction loss. But the question is, what kind of loss can I use to have sharper results as an output? So, of course, if we go um, more in towards the, the mindset of deep learning, rather than trying to define a loss manually, one can ask oneself, can we actually learn a loss function? Right, so can we have a neural network that tells us when an image looks good and when an image looks bad, right? Instead of having the L2 loss do that, I'm going to have a neural network do the job of judging the output of my generative model. And these are essentially what generative adversarial networks are. So we have our generator. Our generator is the decoder of the autoencoder that we have been seeing before. So we have our latent random variable from which we sample. We have a generator that generates, for example, an image from the latent random variable. And then here typically we would have the L2 loss. We replace this L2 loss by another neural network called the discriminator. So the generative adversarial networks are going to have two neural networks inside the generator network and the discriminator network. And the discriminator has the only task 
of judging whether the image generated by the generator is real or fake, right? So did this generator generate an image that looks real, that looks good, or did it generate an image that looks fake, right? If you pass on a very blurry image, the discriminator might say, no, no, generator, you did a really bad job, this is a fake image. Now, this is going to be our loss, right? The real or fake judgment by the discriminator is going to be, in the end, our loss, instead of the L2 reconstruction loss. And so, in order to train this, of course, we need to train it with a pool of real-world images, so that we can feed two images, one image from the real world, any image you want, and one image from the generator that has been generated by the neural network generator. Now, the discriminator judges these two images and says, well, this is real and this is fake. Now, the goal of generative adversarial networks and why it has the word adversarial in it is because the generator is going to be trained to be better and better at, generated, at generating images, right? Generating always more and more realistic images, while the discriminator is training itself to be better and better at recognizing the fake images from the generator, right? So the generator becomes better, generates more realistic images. So the discriminator has to compensate by becoming better at discriminating those images generated by the generator. So the goal of the discriminator is always to say that these samples are real and these samples are fake. Once the discriminator is fooled by the generator, it means that our generator is good at generating realistically looking images. And since both the generator and the discriminator are neural networks, they keep improving each other with backpropagation. So essentially, for real data, right, the only thing we need to do is we need to sample one image from the data and pass it through the discriminator. And the discriminator tries to be near one, right? The output of the discriminator for real images needs to be always one, it needs to say always that this is a real image. For the fake data, the input noise, right, our, our latent variable Z, passes through the generator, which generates an image. This passes through the discriminator and now what is going to happen is that the discriminator is going to try to identify this generated image, G of Z, as a fake. Therefore, the G of Z needs to be low, near zero, while the generator tries the opposite, tries to generate an image such that D G of Z is closer to one, is closer to real. Right, discriminator wants to bring it down to fake, generator wants to bring it up to real. And so this is um, the discriminator loss, this um, process that we have explained now, where um, the discriminator tries to bring this um, real um, image, right? The discriminator judges real images and tries to classify them as real while here it tries to classify the generated image as fake, right? And the generator loss does the opposite. And we can, we can view this as a min-max game, right? Where G is minimizing the probability that D is correct, right? It's trying to generate images to fool the discriminator. And the equilibrium is found uh, when the, the discriminator and the, and the generator are sort of balanced, right? We need to find an equilibrium between generator and discriminator. Now, the key thing here is that the discriminator is the one providing supervision, providing the gradients in order to train the generator, right? This is our loss function that we are learning, but we're also using to train the generator. Now, this is, of course, only a brief overview of GANs, right? The, the intuition behind GANs. And there's actually a huge zoo of GAN networks that are used to generate all kinds of images and all kinds of outputs.
So with Gantz, we can do really cool stuff. We can generate images that are now in really high definition. So these are samples from images that are not real. Right? These images were not captured by any camera, but were generated by a gun, by using, for example, lots of images of dogs and you know, learning what a dog looks like, and then being able to generate the first image here. So these results are really, really impressive. And we have very, um, very prominent works on uh, face image generation, style gun and style gun too. These are all non-existing faces. So faces that have been generated from scratch, from this random vector. We also have other cool applications that come, for example, from CycleGun that is unpaired image to image translation. So we're able to take any image, for example, of a horse and convert it into a zebra. And this can be done following this ICCV 17 paper, the cycle gun paper, by having unpaired images. So I don't need to have ground truth for a horse and the same horse that looks like a zebra, but I just need to have images of zebras and images of horses. And then I can train a neural network to zebrify my horse images. And the same thing can be used to convert daytime images into nighttime images or any kind of conversion uh, you want to have. You can also have um, gun-based image editing. So converting this uh, kind of sketch that you see here on the left into a real image and being able to change it however you want. For example, you have here this, this C um, scenario in which you have a rock, you have the sky, and suddenly you draw all of this area which should look like sand and your generated image completely changes and a beach appears here. Of course, there are other dependencies also. Uh, for example, the color of the sky suddenly depends on, uh, on whether there is sand in here or not. Uh, this comes from the, from the pool of training images, but still really, um, really cool results. And finally, some of the work that we did uh, recently on face anonymization, in which uh, we can anonymize a face. For example, this is a video of myself. Um, and, and some other students in the lab, and the face of this person is changed in order to have, um, in order to anonymize these videos for uh, for multiple object tracking, in which uh, we do a lot of work. Good. So we're moving to the third topic of this lecture. We will have a very, very, very brief introduction to reinforcement learning, and I emphasize that this is going to be very brief just to give the very high level idea because um, there are full lectures on reinforcement learning here at TUM uh, and it would be absolutely impossible to explain all the research behind reinforcement learning all the methods in just 15-20 uh, minutes of course but we still want to roughly explain what is reinforcement learning right because this is a completely new paradigm in machine learning. We have discussed supervised learning, right? Classification, regression. We know how to do image classification with convolutional neural networks. And we know that for this, we need label data. This is why this is supervised learning. And so when we train a neural network for the supervised task, we're finding this mapping between input and label. With unsupervised learning, we can do other tasks. We can do, for example, clustering or anomaly detection. And for this, we have unlabeled data. So we have lots of images, but without any label. And the goal of unsupervised learning is rather to find some structure in the data. You know, what images look similar, what images look different. But there's a third paradigm, the paradigm of reinforcement learning in which we want to learn by interacting with what we call the environment, right? So, so the learning process is going to be different in the sense that we're going to interact with an environment and we're going to get some feedback from the environment. This is going to be 
our label, right? Our annotations are going to be this, this feedback that we get from the environment. And so, um, in a nutshell, a reinforcement learning agent is going to be trained using a carrot and stick approach. So the agent is going to perform an action and good behavior, a good action, is going to be encouraged by reward and bad behavior is going to be discouraged by punishment. So if the action gets you closer to your goal, you're going to get a reward. If it gets you further away to your goal, you're going to be punished for it. So with this, we can do really cool stuff, right? So we can, for example, teach an agent to walk. And it might look a little bit, you know, random that the motions that it's doing but this is all learned by trial and error. So the agent tries to do motion, and if it falls down, for example, it receives a punishment. So of course the agent is always going to have some failure modes. But each mistake that it does, it helps it to learn how to do it better. So how can I train such a funny figure to walk around and not fall into holes? So this happens with the interaction between an agent and an environment. So here we have the example of the Super Mario in which you want to train this agent, this neural network, to survive in this environment, to not be killed, to not fall into holes. And so the agent and the environment will interact in several ways. First of all, the environment is going to send an observation to the, to the agent, right? How does the, the screen look like at this time point, right? For example, we see there's this mushroom here, there's this platform here. So the agent takes a look at the environment and then decides to do an action, right? Either jumping up or moving to the right or doing any other action, any other, any of the allowed actions is the one that the agent is going to choose for this time step. So with the observation, the agent performs an action and now the environment judges this action and comes back to the agent with a reward, right? Did you do a good action or a bad action, right? Did you get killed immediately or did you collect some bonus, right? Positive or negative reward. And so the idea is that um, you have these sequential turn of events, right? So, so you have all of these actions and these actions have an effect on the environment, right? So, so whenever you jump up, you're going to change the environment because the camera, for example, is going to move up. If you move to the right, the environment is going to change. So your actions have um, are, are changing the future input right, are changing the environment. And again, there is no supervisor here, right? There are no annotations, right? So the, the target is actually approximated by the reward signal. This is the only thing you have to learn. And um, of course, this idea that the agent needs to make decisions and these decisions are based on the history of, of observations, right? Because your actions are changing the future it means that you need to take into account all of the history. You need to take into account all of the observation, action, reward that you did at the beginning all the way to the end in order to make a decision, right? So if you put all of this history together, now you need to have a mapping between the history and um, the state S, right? In, with which you're going to make a decision. Right? So you have the history, like all, everything that has happened beforehand, and this creates a state. Now, of course, this is impossible, right? This is really hard to maintain because history grows linearly over time, right? So if we have to take into account 
all the past movements that Mario did before it got to this point, this is going to be just impossible to process. So your solution is to use a mark of assumption. That is that the state ST is mark of if it only depends on the past state. So essentially, the future state ST plus one depends on the past state. So the future is going to be independent of the past given the present, right? I'm going to ignore all the states S1 all the way to ST minus one. And ST plus one is going to depend only on ST. Now, the reward and the next state are going to be functions of the current observation and the action AT only. And this is important, important to keep things manageable, right? This is what we get from the Markov assumption. And so we can see the uh, reinforcement learning problem as a Markov decision process. It is defined by the set of possible states, the set of possible actions, the distribution of the reward, right? So if I do an action, given the current state, am I getting a positive or negative reward? Also the transition probability of a state action pair. What is the probability that, you know, given a state and action, I do another action, end up in another state? And also a discount factor, which discounts future rewards. This is um, kind of a detail. But the idea is that I'm going to have two components of the reinforcement learning agent. One, the policy, which maps from state to action, right? What kind of action am I going to do given the current state? And the value function or the Q function, which evaluates how good is a state or how good is a state action pair, right? So it's it tries to predict the expected future reward, right? If I do this action, am I going to get a positive reward or am I going to get punished, right? These, these are the components of the agent. One that performs the action, the other that tries to predict with this action, you know, am I going to get punished or not? And there are tons and tons of reinforcement learning algorithms based on different types of policy definition, different types of Q uh, function definitions. Um, so, so it's really a huge field. And so if you're interested in reinforcement learning, we would recommend you to take a dedicated class which works only on reinforcement learning and looks at all of these model-free versus model-based uh, reinforcement learning how to optimize your policy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So really interesting and exciting field. And so with reinforcement learning, the community has achieved some really impressive things. Like for example, people have successfully trained a model that plays different Atari games like Pong, Breakout, Spacing Barriers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and plays them successfully. And the only reward is, for example, the score. So, so this is really impressive that you can train an agent to play different Atari games. Or um, the Alpha Zero, right? So this was um, a transformer-based network, which um, was trained on 200 years of StarCraft play. So really, like huge um, training amount, like like. Um, the game played an equivalent of 200 years of StarCraft in order to beat a professional StarCraft, a StarCraft player. So, so this is already a really advanced neural network that is beating the world-ranked number 13 professional StarCraft player in this game. So, so really advanced neural network to be able to do that. And with this, we have reached the end of the I2DL lecture. So in this lecture, Introduction to Deep Learning, we started with really the basics of machine learning. What does it mean to do unsupervised versus supervised learning? We started with linear versus logistic regression, and we moved then to neural networks.
We also discussed uh, about data splitting. This is incredibly important. I cannot stress enough to have proper data splitting. And researchers nowadays still struggle to find a good data splitting for, um, for their training and test set. So really important to take a look at the data, split it properly and have a training validation and test splits. Now we moved um, after the machine learning basics into an introduction to neural networks. Starting with a backpropagation, so how neural networks are really optimized, going through activation functions, loss functions, what is the effect of having different loss functions, the hinge loss functions, softmax. And we then discussed several optimization methods for, uh, for neural networks based on uh, gradient descent, what is the effect and the importance of regularization, and uh, what is um, the effect of different parameters, hyperparameters, like for example, the learning rate. So really important to observe always your training procedure so that you can see whether you have proper learning rate, proper hyperparameters. And then we went over different types of neural networks, right? We went over CNNs, in-depth, um, autoencoders, we went over recurrent neural networks, and in this lecture we had a brief look at advanced architectures, variational autoencoders, attention, graph neural networks, or GANs. So of course this is an introductory course in deep learning, right? This should be the very first course where you get in touch with deep learning and in the basics of deep learning. And once you have this uh, basis well established, then it is time to take um, the advanced course in deep learning, right? So the advanced courses are organized around introduction to deep learning so that you can take first introduction to deep learning and know the basis and then move on towards advanced topics like for example deep learning in robotics, deep learning for physics, deep learning for medical applications or deep learning for vision which uh, Professor Nisner and myself are also teaching. And uh, we want to be clear that introduction to deep learning and machine learning are not overlapping lectures. So it is worth taking both lectures so that you see different types of uh, machine learning techniques which are not deep learning. So it's always important to have this overview of different uh, machine learning techniques. And in the machine learning course, you also go more in depth into the basics of machine learning. And so at TUM, we are uh, expanding constantly the courses on deep learning, right? So the idea is that this introduction to deep learning course is the basis for then a series of advanced deep learning lectures. And the advanced topics are typically only for master's students. They are in preparation for uh, your master thesis. And in the case of deep learning for computer vision, which is the lecture that uh, Matthias and I are teaching, this is ADL4CV. We cover different advanced architectures like Siamese neural network. We cover in depth autoencoders and variational autoencoders, also in depth GANs, multidimensional CNNs, graph neural networks, domain adaptation, and many other topics. And the idea in ADL4CV is not so much the lectures, but the practical part. So we have a project that lasts the whole semester. And this is the core part of ADL for CV, right? This is the really interesting part, which allows you to do some research with deep learning in computer vision. So we are aware that this practical part is very time consuming. So please do not sign up for ADL for CV unless you're willing to spend a lot of time on the project and you really enjoy doing research in computer vision. And I2DL, um, you need to have attended I2DL in order to attend ADL for CV. This is a prerequisite that we have because we have a lot of demand on the uh, on this course. So we need to have uh, to make sure that you have a good basis in introduction to deep learning. 
And then um, I myself am teaching a lecture on uh, detection, segmentation and tracking called Computer Vision 3, which is a summer semester only lecture in which we cover other topics like object detection, one stage versus two stage, multiple object tracking, semantic segmentation, instant segmentation and video segmentation. We cover trajectory prediction and we go at the end to the 3D world. And we do all of this uh, with a very deep learning oriented mind. So most of the techniques that we will present, I would say 99% of the techniques are going to be deep learning based. So it's also very much encouraged to take I2DL before taking computer vision 3. So as you have guessed, this is the last lecture of I2DL. We still have one more exciting talk, which is happening on Friday, the 24th of July. This is going to be a guest lecture by Professor Antonio Torralba, who is a professor at MIT. And this is going to be a live event on YouTube, so you can all watch the lecture, you can ask questions on the YouTube chat, and the talk is also going to be available later as a recorded video, so you can watch it anytime. We will send more information on the exact time on Moodle. And uh, we then have um, the last appointment for the lecture, which is, of course, the exam. This will happen on site on August 11th. It's going to be from 8 to 9.30. And uh, we all hope that you can make it there. There will not be a retake exam because this lecture is happening every semester. You're welcome to take the exam uh, in the next semester, if you have a bonus, this will be transferred also to the next semester, so no problem, you will not have to redo the exercises. And during the exam, you cannot use a cheat sheet and you cannot use a calculator. So on behalf of Matthias and myself, we thank you for attending this lecture, um, sticking with us through all the topics in Introduction to Deep Learning. As you can see here, Matthias is leading the Visual Computing Lab and there's tons of cool research uh, that he's doing in 3D scanning and reconstruction, uh, deep learning for 3D understanding, video generation and neural rendering. So if you're interested in these topics, in these research topics, do not hesitate to contact him, do not hesitate um, to contact him for a guided research projects, for uh, practical projects and do not hesitate also to sign up for ADL for CV in which you will be working in some of these topics so either Professor Nisner's topics or my own group's topics so I lead the dynamic vision and learning group at TUM and we work on video segmentation multiple object tracking uh, camera localization and also some video generation especially for anonymization and for data privacy. So again, please uh, feel free to, to contact us to sign up for uh, the advanced lectures, either ADL for CV or CV3 DST, to delve deeper and deeper into, into this cool world that is deep learning, computer vision and all the nice research um, that we are doing here at TUM. Thank you so much for attending this lecture and good luck in the exam.